Hello, hello, good evening. This is Dallas Cohen, the Rebound Coach, and I am so happy and excited that you are here tonight or you are listening to the replay at some other time of the day. <laughs> um, glad you're here. Tonight is special, and we're going to talk about something um, I think pretty necessary and um, definitely something that can help you move forward in your life and free yourself. And so um, you might be like, um, who are you and what is this and why are you here? Why are you on my feed right now? So my name is Dallas Cohen. I'm the Rebound Coach from thereboundcoach.com. And if you're not sure what a Rebound Coach is, I'm happy to share. And so today, today's topic of conversation on the Rebound Coach Live is what's your untold story? And um, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of my story, which is not untold, but <laughs> it was for a long time. So I was uh, raised in a, oops, just realized, just realized my mic was off. Huh, there's that. Um, we're also streaming on Clubhouse. So for the Clubhouse recording, they just got started. Uh, they didn't hear me for the first minute. So um, welcome, glad you're here. And uh, I was just sharing a bit of my story. Today's topic is what's your untold story? And so my story for a very long time was untold and was only partially told, okay? We told the good parts. <laughs> we told the parts we wanted to share and left out the parts we didn't wanna share. And so um, I was raised in a godly home. I had parents, they loved God, they loved each other. They were married for a lifetime until my mom passed away. My, uh, my mom had terminal illness and my dad was her caretaker. So I got to see what it was like for someone to really care for their spouse in, in very physical, practical means, but um, also really care for her. And so they were, far as, as far as I'm concerned, a great example of marriage. At the same time, I was molested from age eight to age 16. And so that radically affects how you see yourself as your identity is forming in those years, how I related to God in a house of, of faith and how I related to men. And so fast forward when I met the man that I married and eventually divorced, um, there were definitely red flags. There were definitely reasons for me not to continue in the relationship, but there were other factors in play. Number one, uh, I'm a woman of faith and I believed that God was with us. And not and because of that, because I believed he was with us, I believed that whatever trouble would come, we'd be able to overcome it. And trouble came right away, y'all. <laughs> it, uh, you know, some people have this experience where they um, have a honeymoon period and then Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not me. Um, there was trouble right off the bat and it never quite went away. It would just kind of fade into the background um, and then recycle in some sort of crisis. And we'd call that coping in crisis where we're just like barely making it. And then boom, this big issue. And then we'd barely be making it and then boom. <laughs> and uh, the booms happened more and more as the years went on and things kind of came to a head about 10 years in really nine, nine years and change. Um, January of 2020, he left for another woman and it was that next day the following. I found out him and that woman had been plotting my murder for months. Um, truth of the matter is he had spent years wishing me dead. And um, needless to say, like, that was a, if you if you're listening to a movie and you hear the record scratch or like that's that's the kind of moment it was um everything was threatened who i was as a wife a mom a woman a child of god a human being like all of that was threatened and who i was as a coach i had been a life coach i've been a life coach 20 years and had been coaching in marriage and family relationships um, maybe five or six years by that point uh, among the faith-based community. So if you can imagine spending your time 
and building an identity and building a platform around this idea of you must stay married until death do you part. That's the only way to please God. And if your husband's sinning against you, you just pray, you just pray, you just pray. And that's all you do. And um, that was literally my platform. And so I had a lot of pride around that. I had a lot of judgment towards um, divorced women, especially divorced women of faith. And in that time, in that moment, I mean, my very uh, identity was threatened and I had to make a choice. You know, I could continue the path I was on, right? I could allow the identity that my former husband had planned for me to tell me who I was, tell me what I could have, how many days I was allowed on the earth, or I could choose life. And so out of that entire story, I've written a book. It's called I Choose Life. I'm going to put that over here. <laughs> I Choose Life, Rewrite Your Love Story and Change Your Legacy. And that's exactly what God has given me the power to do. And I continue in it every day. And that's what I have the honor of walking other people through the opportunity to change their legacy, rewrite their love story and change their legacy. And so if you would like one of these books, <laughs> you can find that at, I'm looking for my button, thereboundcoach.com forward slash book. That is thereboundcoach.com forward slash book. You can uh, order from Amazon right from there or you can order one of these physical copies and I will sign it for you. I'd be more than happy to. So it is it is a resource. It's not just a story. It's not just a story. It is a manual. It's a resource for those who want to be free, not just of domestic violence, but of the um, bounds we put on ourselves. Because there had to be... I was predisposed to be in a relationship like that. Um, there were situations that happened in my life prior to, not notwithstanding the um, the sexual abuse as a, as a child. There were situations that preempted that, that made made it easier for me to say yes to things that I did not deserve. And so, we're going to talk about stories today in two different ways. And one is, you know, maybe the level you think of when you think about an untold story. And then one is a little bit deeper than that. So what's your untold story? <laughs> um, a story kept silent can't help you or others. So in the case of not just domestic violence, but, you know, any sort of mistreatment or any sort of pain or trauma, right? When we don't acknowledge it, or even offenses, okay? I was telling, telling my daughters about offenses, um, even just this evening. And when we have an offense, small or large, and we don't address it. And address it, sometimes we can go to that person and say, hey, this offended me, let's talk it out. Sometimes that's not possible, right? And even when it's not possible, it's still required, not just requested, but required that we deal with it, that we personally deal with it. That means I forgive that person. Doesn't mean what they did was okay. Doesn't mean I'm going to accept them back into my life. It doesn't mean they have full access now. It's not what any of that means. <laughs> it just means I'm not holding on to the grudge to my right to revenge or um, wishing them harm or wishing them the exact treatment they gave me. Like none of those things are healthy for us. So releasing that, um, but not just releasing offenses, but an untold story when you don't acknowledge. So the opposite of dealing with it is to stuff it down, right? So those are offenses and, and abuses cause offenses, even when we quote unquote, take it right. So, Often, um, maybe a, a woman is emotionally abused or financially abused or spiritually abused. And there's all of these tiny infractions that happen all the time. There's certain looks, there's certain attitudes. You might share good news with your significant other and they kind of act like they got a problem with that, right? So at the beginning, you might, oh, I'm not quite sure 
um, that sounded like shade. <laughs> like that sounded like uh, I didn't like how you came at me right there. Um, that sounded like you didn't trust me to make decisions over my own life. Hey, that sounded like um, you want to control. Uh, you want to control me. That sounded like you have a trust problem, right? So those offenses start off small and, and maybe we're not sure what they are, but when you watch over time and there's a cycle of, in particular, power and control, those things show that that's an abusive and or the word toxic, toxic, I don't always like to use that word, but that is um, those traits, those traits are showing up. And so we have a choice and we can continue to um, reevaluate. And so for people like myself who are kind of thinkers and processors and evaluators and analyzers, um, when stuff happens, we kind of catalog all the stuff. We catalog all the stuff. Like we don't forget any of the stuff and we kind of mentally keep record. Um, and that is a first step but there comes a point we have to address the thing. We can't just keep taking on data, right? Eventually you have enough data. Now it's time to make a decision on whether or not this behavior trend that you're seeing is something you choose for yourself. And you might say, well, that's something they're doing. I'm not doing the whatever it is. I'm not doing the lying or I'm not doing the half truths, telling you half truths and full lies, right? Um, even though they might be doing the thing, you allowing that thing means you're choosing that behavior for yourself. You're choosing that behavior in your life. You're allowing that behavior in your life. Um, I was mitigating my kids and toys and fights, uh, today <laughs> and over the recently, um, dealing with them over fighting over toys and fighting over stuff. And I, you know, I broke it down into this, this lesson on boundaries and treatment, even though someone else might be doing the bad behavior. If the bad behavior is done towards you and you did not address it, you are allowing that. You're choosing that behavior for yourself. And something about you tells you that that's okay. Even when it's not, even when up here might say, hey, that's not okay. Down here says, oh, I'm going to accept that because I want something right? Or one thing is better than the other. I want, uh, I want this person's physical presence close more than I want to not be mistreated, right? So people choose, I, I choose this person close to me. That's, that's better than, hey, you're not treating me well, better than being treated well. And uh, that is a choice that we need to make. Um, do I deserve to be treated well more than I want somebody's physical presence close or, you know, liking someone who likes me, right? Um, wanting to feel chosen versus wanting to be treated well, right? So if you're chosen to be a punching bag, it's not a good choice, even though they're choosing you. Okay. So silence about abuse stories don't help you, don't help other people or any kinds of mistreatment or offenses when we don't bring that up even with ourselves and we don't reconcile that with ourselves or reconcile it with God, um, we're allowing it to fester and continue to live and cause us destruction. Whether that's imploding, like I, I hate myself, I don't treat myself well, or that's exploding, I'm going to mistreat somebody else now because I'm offended. Same deal. We have to internally deal um, with the offenses, small, big, a million of them or just one, um, the story must be told. Um, also, yes, yeah, so silence about abuse enables that abuse to continue. And I will say the same for uh, institutional leadership. So if you are a church leader, um, if you're a civic leader, if you're a boss at a business or a corporation and someone's, you know, you witness mistreatment of any kind, one person against another, one person against themselves, somebody against you, and we don't say anything. 
that enables that behavior to continue. And um, sin grows. <laughs> sin grows. So um, what starts off as a small thing turns into something big and hairy and scary because we don't deal, right? So dealing with offenses, like I said, small or large, just one or a whole bunch is really, really important. Silence about offenses, silence about abuse, silence about wounds, silence about trauma is dangerous, it is very dangerous. So I'd like you to think about your untold story and bit of housekeeping. If you happen to use Clubhouse, we are also simulcasting on Clubhouse. And what we'll do after I'm done my portion here is do kind of a fireside chat uh, after party when you can share your untold story with me. And I'd love to hear it. So you can look me up as Dallas Cohen um, on Clubhouse, <laughs> Dallas Cohen on Clubhouse, uh, or um, the, the name of the room is What's Your Untold Story? Listen, then share. Um, we're at the Sanctuary, Sanctuary XP Club. So that's just a bit of housekeeping. Or if you are on Clubhouse, you can join me over here on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the rebound coach. All right. So one level we've talked about already of untold story is the untold story of your wounds, of any abuse, of trauma, of um, offenses, right? So it's important to tell those stories, to acknowledge them. The other side of that, so I just want to go just a little bit deeper. There are untold stories of your heart. These are stories that you tell yourself about yourself, about your life, about what you deserve, what you can have, what you're allowed to stretch for, um, who's allowed to come into your life, who's allowed to come into your bed, who's allowed to come into your body, all of those things. Those are stories we tell ourselves. Um, what happiness we're allowed to have in our current circumstances is a story we've told ourselves, right? Like, I'll be happy when X, Y, Z. I'll be happy when X, Y, Z, right? So before X, Y, Z, we're literally telling ourselves, well, we can't be satisfied. We can't be happy with our day. We can't be too excited because X, Y, Z hasn't happened yet, right? A lot for, for women um, around relationship that, ha I, you know, I'll be happy when I'm married. I'll be happy when I'm married. You know, when I have a man, I'll be happy then, <laughs> right? And uh, truth of the matter is, if you have an if then, when you get when you get married, when you get the man, uh, you still won't be happy. Hey, Jamie, glad you made it. <laughs> um, so there's a deeper level to it. The stories we tell ourselves are the untold stories that really, really can hold us back. It is um, deeper than anything that someone may have told us over the years. It is what we chose to believe. It is what we choose to remember. It is what we choose to rehearse. And it is what we choose to um, subconsciously tell ourselves to act out. Okay. So I'm going to give you some examples from my own life. I am in this journey with you. <laughs> so as I mentioned, you know, I am choosing life every day. I'm rewriting my love story and changing my legacy every day. And so I'm in the season where I'm examining the stories I've told myself. And I'll I'll kind of I'll tell you the examples and then I will show you the process for your how to take action for yourself. So for me, um, some stories I told myself is if I ask people for what I really need, they'll leave. They'll reject me, they'll say no. Um, so I should just take whatever I'm given and be really happy with that and teach myself how to be satisfied with less, right? Or what they call settle, okay? So I could probably trace that back to an example in my childhood of when I asked somebody for what I needed and didn't get it and got rejected. And so I took that on as a belief and it became a story. And maybe I didn't verbalize that story and maybe I didn't um, think about it consciously, but subconsciously 
it was definitely in play, which is why in many, many in my relationships, I did not ask for what I wanted. I didn't identify what I wanted. I didn't give myself permission to even think about what the benefit I wanted in the relationship, right? Um, just kind of taking whatever they gave me and crafting my pleasure out of serving this other person, loving this other person and being good to this other person. While there definitely are benefits to loving other people and serving and giving and being kind and um, nurturing another person and, and speaking to their heart. Like there's so much benefit in that. At the same time, my issue and many people who, many women who have been in abusive relationships, specifically emotionally abusive relationships, um, their issue is not loving the other person. Like they're real good at that. <laughs> the issue is loving them, loving themselves and coming from a place of self-love. And that requires, it includes and, and requires saying no to behavior that doesn't doesn't agree with that, right? So that was one of the stories I used to tell myself and that's how it played out in relationships. Another one um, that's been around a long time is you're not doing it right and you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough, you're not doing it right. You're not doing enough, you're not doing it right. Strong achievers, I serve high achieving women high achieving women of faith who've lived through betrayal, trauma, or abuse of any kind, and who want to reclaim territory in their relationship with themselves. And so, <laughs> so this whole thing about, I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing enough. That was uh, thank you, Jamie. Yes, you do. That um, that's been around a long time. And that is something that drives high achievers. So I know I'm not by myself. I know this isn't, you know, this isn't just something that Dallas picked up. This is something that a lot of high achieving women believe that they're just not doing enough. And if they just did more, things would work out the way they wanted. And if they just did it right, things would work out the way they wanted, especially the doing right part. That happens a lot in faith-based circles around relationship. They literally train women if you do it right, and and depending on who you're talking to, right is different. <laughs> if you do it right, then everything's going to be great, right? For example, a uh, really common teaching, if you don't have sex before marriage, you're going to have a faithful husband. You're going to have a husband that, that really loves you and is not just trying to get sex and uh, you're going to have a husband that loves God. If he said he loves God and he's not having sex with you before you got married, he must be a good guy. Those things are not true. <laughs> it's just not true. There's no guarantee that if you wait for sex before marriage, your husband's not going to cheat on you or leave you. It's just not, it's just, there's just no guarantee. Now, um, that doesn't mean you should go whoring because that's also not good advice. <laughs> okay. Not good advice. And there's all sorts of scientific studies that say uh, waiting to be intimate uh, until you're married is good for the marriage um, and good for your happiness and good for lots of things. So not advocating fornication. I am saying that the, the underlying narrative behind that is you got to do it right. If you don't live together before you're married and you don't have sex before you're married, and in certain circles, if you don't kiss before you're married and you don't touch and you have group dates and your parents approve and you do this whole thing, I'm not going to go into that. But if you do this whole thing the way we approve, it's going to work out. And that's, it's not true. It's not true. There's no guarantees of that. Okay. You should do the right thing because that's your standard to do the right thing. Not because it guarantees any particular result because we can't guarantee results. So um, that is, uh, you're not doing it right. You're not doing enough is kind of a, um, I imagine it like a, a whip, you know, like when people, the cowboys used to ride horses and whip them. <laughs> like, that's what I imagine that being, you're not doing it right. Like, come on, work faster, work harder, do more, fix it. And then when, when things don't work out the way we want, we say, oh man, if I had just done more, if I had just done it right, you know, um, 
That's what it says in the Bible. Do the right, do the right thing. Yeah. Do God's word. Um, you, you do the right thing because you love God. You do the right thing because that's the kind of person you choose to be. Um, not because it's going to make another person do anything else, right? Or guarantee that the person you're dealing with is anyone else. Um, what I have heard many, many cases of um, was just deception, where there was a man who played like he was a godly man and he said all the right things and he checked all the boxes and he went to church and he did all the stuff. And he waited and he was kind and all this. And then something switched, right? So there's just, all I'm saying, there's no guarantees. You do the right thing because that's what you choose to do. That's who you choose to be. That's how you choose to honor God. Um, not because that's going to guarantee me a good life or good marriage or good whatever, right? Like you're in control of that, not the other person. So um, <laughs> Yes, bought the teacher. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the other, the last one I'll talk about is um, I do all the right things and it didn't work out. So this one, I'm literally, I am still in this process. So I promise you, not coming to you from a place of I've got it all together and you need to get like me. No, I'm sharing my process in the process. Okay. So um, I watched my father. So I, I shared my story at the beginning of this live. Um, another part of that story is I was homeless with my dad twice. I've been homeless twice. Um, he's been homeless four times. And so he shares a story. So it's not like a secret, but I would watch, um, what I perceived my father to be doing all the right things. He was a godly man. We our our business was a ministry marketplace ministry, and um, he was working very hard to do the right thing by God, by other people. And um, I watched as, you know, we our, our lights would be turned off or the water would be turned off or um, we had to move because we were being evicted uh, or foreclosed on. And the way my dad would package it for us is, you know, this is you know, we're the underdogs and this is what happens when you obey God and you do the right thing. And, you know, this is the struggle and we're going to make it like he was doing the best he could with what he knew. That's what we all do. So there's no blame or shame. Right. But, um, what that translated to me, a couple things. Number one, I was like, well, shoot, if trusting God has these results, I don't want that. <laughs> I'm going to choose something else. And, uh, and number two, like, man, he did all the right things and it still didn't work out. And so I'm going to do something else. Right. So tied to that same, that other story, you're not doing it right. You're not doing enough. If you did it right. Or if you did enough, things would work out. Right. So that story of, I do all the right things and it doesn't work out. Right. I was talking with God about that and how I did my best to make decisions that didn't, so that wouldn't happen, right? But still that's been part of my narrative. And the Holy Spirit just reminded me like, look how you tell your marriage story. You did all the right things and it didn't work out. Look how you tell sometimes your business story. You did all the right things and it didn't work out. And I, I had to like, oh my goodness. I see a trend. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. And, and it was true. And so the first part of getting free is really just acknowledging the truth underneath the story we tell ourselves, the story that has been a pattern. And so I'm going to go into like steps for how to, um, how how to tell your untold story, because that's really where it starts. And we don't have to have it all figured out. We can just take the very next step. And so um, I want to share that with you briefly. So number one, ask yourself why until you get down to the bottom of the issue. So for me, I had fruit of these stories, how they were showing up in my life, how I was choosing actions that aligned with those stories. And so working with a coach myself, walking through that and thought, okay, why? Why am I choosing this? Why do I believe that? 
why do I believe that? Well, why do I believe that? And and going all the way down till you get to the bottom, that's the story, right? If if I ask people for what I need, if I ask people for too much, they're gonna leave, they're gonna reject me, right? So so I wasn't asking people for that. I was just taking what they would give me or making extra deals or, you know, undercutting my services, my uh, products and services and different things. Cause, Oh no, I, I just, I need you here. And if I don't, I, if I don't undercut or make something free or, you know, take a loss, then uh, you're going to go away. And I really need you to be here and do this. Just coming from a very desperate place. And um, have you, I don't know if you've ever experienced seeing someone who is desperate, right? Like desperate for someone's time or attention or money. Um, somebody who's desperate. Does that make you want to give them what it is they're desperate for? Generally not. <laughs> and you can put it, if you're watching this or watching the replay, you can put in the comments. If you've experienced someone who is desperate, maybe for your time or for your money, that generally means I'm not going to do the thing that you're begging me to do. And I, I've, yeah, I've been the desperate one. Exactly. And so, um, and I've seen that too. So if you see somebody, it's like, Oh, you know, they they call you a bunch of times, they blow up your phone. That makes you not want to talk to them. <laughs> right. They sit too close. Okay. Give me some space. Right. So, when I was coming from that place of like, if I ask for too much, they're going to go away. So I'm not asking for anything. Just please come. Just please come. Just please come. Just please come. People would find their no. They'd find it. And I'd be like, God, the experts say I provoke no's. Why? Right? So you ask yourself why until you get to the bottom. For those of you who have businesses, who are in business or who sell a product or service or an idea or sell yourself, right? Um, if we're provoking no's, there's a reason. And I implore you to find out what that reason is and to address it. Doesn't mean it's going to go away overnight. Doesn't mean, um, you know, you're going to magically fix things in an instant. However, if you're not on a pro on, on a journey to, um, fix what's wrong, essentially, for lack of a better word, you're on a journey to allow that wrong to make more wrong. <laughs> not sure if that made sense. So if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. Okay. That's, that's a better way to say that. If you're not going forward, you're definitely going backwards and uh, enough's enough. So number one, ask why. So you get to the bottom. Number two, look for patterns and uh, number three feeds into one and two, because often we don't, we can't see that. Right. So have that conversation with someone else, have that conversation with a coach or a professional of some sort and help them, let them help you find the bottom of, of what the issues are and, and the patterns. So praying number three, which really should be number one, but I do it this way on purpose. So um, looking for the pattern and praying and saying, okay, God, this is my issue. Um, I don't know why I'm having this issue. Can you help me? Can you help me see it? Can you help me see why I keep coming up broke? Can you help me see why um, every situation I'm in is toxic? Can you help me see why I keep you know, moving or changing and the same thing keeps happening over and over again. Can you tell me why I keep, you know, doing what I think is the right thing and it's not working out? Why is that? Is it the thing that's wrong? Is it my belief that's wrong? If I believe I do the right thing and it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter the things that I'm doing, right? And I, I can change the thing, right? Oh, I'm going to tighten up this process. Oh, I'm going to make sure this is going well. Oh, I'm going to get better at that. And that's going to change it. Well, if my belief is I do the right things and it doesn't work out. If I believe that, then it doesn't matter how I change methods. And people do this with businesses, with uh, family members, with 
I'm going to, you know, move to another city and that's going to do it for me. Or I'm going to change jobs and that's going to do it for me. Or I'm going to, whatever you're going <laughs> to, whatever you're going to do, that doesn't change the internal thought process. And unless you know the untold story, unless you're telling the untold story, you can't address it. So pray, ask for clarity, ask for insight into what the issues are. Yes, those core beliefs. And it starts out with, with knowing what they are. So that's, that's really step one. And the Holy Spirit can show you what they are when you ask. Okay, so here's the practical, right? And you might be like, I don't know how to do this, right? So here, or I don't have anybody to talk to. Okay, here's something you can do. You write down on a piece of paper everything you don't like about your life. And you might think that there's 10,000 things, but once you get going, it's the same couple things over and over, like three to five things that is the issue. And sometimes even one or two, okay? That's underneath all the issues. Well, I don't like this and I don't like this. And I don't, I don't, I don't. Write them all down. Look for your patterns. Look for your stories, okay? Then you write on another page or the other side of the page, you write the opposite of that. So if the issue is, oh, I can't seem to afford anything I really want, right? So the opposite of that is, I have all that I need, right? I have all that I need. I have all that I need, period. I have all that I need. And I can get what I don't have. I can creatively get what I don't have. Um, that's another thing you can do. So write down everything you don't like about your life. Look for your patterns. Look for your story. Look for your underneath. And if you're not sure, call that trusted friend. Call that coach. Be like, hey, look at this with me. What am I telling myself? What's the limiting belief I've been telling myself, right? And then... Okay, once you write all your stuff down, then you write the opposite and you can write I am statements again. So instead of I can't afford this, I can't afford anything, I don't have any money, right? Instead of those things, you would say I have all that I need and I can get what I don't have. I have all that I need and I can get what I don't have. God makes a way for me to get what I need. God makes a way for me to get what I want. Okay. So when you start, it just flourishes from there. When you just, just start, just get started. Um, it'll just flow. Uh, and then take every thought captive. So once you have that list of I am statements and here's what we know, here's what we know. And I'm sure you've heard this before. What you tell yourself, your brain doesn't know the difference when you say I am statements between what's actually true and what you're just telling yourself is true. This is why faith is so powerful. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is what you tell yourself, literally, literally, literally. Faith is what you tell yourself. So you can look at something that looks a certain way and you can tell yourself what the future of that thing is. You can do that in a positive way. We call that faith. You can do that in a negative way. We call that worry, right? So worry is literally faith in the negative. It's this hasn't happened yet, but I believe it's going to be horrible. <laughs> and you sit and you nourish that. I believe it's going to hurt. And I believe it's going to be embarrassing. And I believe that um, I'm not going to like it. And I believe that bad things are going to happen. Like you're literally nurturing fear in negative consequences that have not occurred. That have not occurred. Well, maybe they occurred in the past over something else, but that has not occurred in this situation. And you are forecasting that. And what do we do when we sit in that meditation? Guess what? We take actions that prove, that prove that I'm right. <laughs> Okay, the opposite of that is faith. So taking every thought captive, that means when the thought rises is when you speak the opposite. That's when it happens. So like when you're washing dishes, when you're taking a shower, when you're getting the kids ready for the day, when you are doing whatever you're doing and the thought comes up, oh man, I can't afford that. 
Oh man, this is gonna be really hard. Oh man, it's too much. I can't handle it. This is when you say, I can do all things. I can do all things, every last thing. I can do all the things. <laughs> Through Christ, I can do all the things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah, I got this. That doesn't mean you believe it at first. Matter of fact, your brain's going to fight with you and be like, what? I know you didn't just say that because I got proof of this, 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 and this, right? Like your brain's going to do all the things. It's all right. The brain gets to do anything it wants to do. You're in control. Okay. You're in control. You tell yourself, you say self, self say, hmm. <laughs> like Mr. Brown, okay? You tell yourself what is true. And you can acknowledge, I hear you, brain. I know those things happened in the past, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all the things, every last thing. I can do every last thing. <laughs> and literally encourage yourself. So it starts with acknowledging your story. It starts with looking for patterns. It starts with uh, telling yourself the truth, the whole truth. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. And uh, then taking, writing the opposite, writing your truth, rewriting your story, rewriting your story. And it can happen right in the moment. It's, it's good when we can sit and meditate and journal. That's excellent. You can sit, you can pray, you can reflect, you can meditate, you can journal. And those are great things to have. But not all, we're not always able to do that. Or for whatever happens, we stay up late, we need to sleep for the second and whatever, whatever's going on. So you can do this during your day, okay? And if you get to write it down, that's awesome. If you don't get to write it down, that's okay. You can just speak it. Yeah, and I do recommend speaking out loud. <laughs> I do recommend speaking out loud, okay? So right in the moment, that thought rises, nope. I can do all things. I have everything that I need and I can get what I don't have. I have everything that I need. Just repeat it. I have everything that I need and I can get what I don't have. And it comes to me. What I need comes to me. Creative ways to get what I need come to me. And I take action, right? Like all, you can just continue to encourage yourself. The more you do it, the stronger you become. And keep this in mind. Um, we didn't get to our habits overnight. You know, I serve grown women and grown people. We didn't get to having our issues overnight and we won't undo them overnight either. But again, you're either in forward motion or backwards motion. So you are either um, overcoming the untold story or your untold story is overcoming you. And the beautiful thing is, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, folks listening to the replay, you get to change that. You are in control. I told someone recently, you get to decide when it's your turn. You get to decide. You get to decide when it is your turn. And here's what we tell ourselves. No, I can't. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to serve these kids. I have to serve this man. I have to work this job. I have to make this money. I have to do for my mom. I have to do for these other people. Like I have to keep up the house. Like we tell ourselves everything else, literally everything else, <laughs> except you know what? I am worth it. You know what? I am worth the same effort I put out to everyone else. I am worth that effort. Because we work for whatever our priorities are. Whatever we've decided is important, that's where we're putting the time, that's where we're putting the money, that's where we're putting the energy, that's where we're putting the worry and the fear, and that's where we're putting the, the faith. That's where it all goes. Whatever we call important. And for many people, that's what society calls important. Making money, uh, keeping your family up, um, taking care of your kids, which... Those things are important. And if you're married, taking care of your marriage, those things are important. You know what also is important? You. You're also important. Healing from your wounds is also important. And we have to decide whether or not we are, we have to decide whether or not we're going to allow what we have going on now to be forever. 
Okay. We could allow that stuff to just sit on top of us and grind out responsibilities until the day we die. Like that's a choice. Another choice is to say, you know what? I am just as valuable as these other things and these other people. And I'm going to put energy into me. The beautiful thing about that choice is when we do what grows is something so beautiful. It can feed those other people, those other responsibilities. It feeds them instead of starving them. We starve them when we don't feed us. So there's an opportunity in two weekends, two weekends to feed you, to share your untold story in a safe place with people who will give you love and care and support. It's called the Sanctuary Experience. It's on April 8th through 10th. And um, that's coming up very shortly. And it's in Clearwater Beach. And here's the real. I've been hearing not just my own untold story, but many untold stories as I'm inviting women to Sanctuary. And the stories are pretty consistent, right? I can't because money. I can't because time. I can't because babysitter. I can't because husband. I can't because fill in the blank of something or someone you've put above your own healing. <laughs> and so I'm going to play uh, a short video inviting you to an escape, an escape, an escape, a safe place to learn, heal, grow. So I'm going to play this video right quick and we will wrap up and do our after party in Clubhouse. <laughs> Sanctuary is coming up soon. It's a special invitation and it is for women. Uh, there will be a sanctuary for men and for couples in the coming months. And you can find out more about that on Clubhouse, which is where we're going in a minute. Um, but it's an invitation to tell your untold story in safety. Tell your untold story in safety and allow people to support you and support your naked, right? We do a lot of covering up. We do a lot of um, secret keeping. We do a lot of image management and public relations <laughs> and all sorts of things um, to kind of keep ourselves safe. Um, it's not effective. It never works. We don't feel safe. We just do the things, right? So Sanctuary is creating a safe place, an intentional safe place. What's image management? So image, your image, like how, how you're seen in the world, managing that image. So for example, um, women who are in abusive marriages, um, 
do a lot of image management. So think about the pastor's wife who gets uh, abused. And I don't mean hit in, well, in some cases hit, but who gets emotionally abused or financially abused, or, um, you know, he's using the Bible to strong arm and force his will on her for sex on her. And she's married to the pastor and he's raping her like that. Those things happen. So she has to kind of protect the reputation, her reputation. That's image management. That's public relations. She's out smiling. She's, uh, you know, doing the, the family dinners and inviting people over and acting like the good church wife. Right. So that's that's image management. That's just one example. But we all do it. We all do it. Social media. Hello. Social media is image management. <laughs> all of it. All of it. We're putting out the parts we want people to see that literally we want people to like, like it can't be any, uh, any more clear to human nature. So uh, we do a lot of that. And even in church circles and in church events, and especially, 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 okay, so, so there's women's conferences and there's women retreats and like, oh, the ladies ministry is doing this devotional. Okay, 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 okay. So here's the deal. People, uh, they they do those exercises where they're supposed to like tell the truth and they don't tell the truth. You know why? Because they have to go see those people later in the week. <laughs> and the image management, <clears throat> if they want to um, do their PR right, they can't go all out. They can't tell the whole truth. So they they uh, shade and and there's teachings. They teach uh, um, women in the church and they say, well, you can't talk bad about your husband. Like that's a sin. Right. So if he's abusing her, you can't talk about that. You can't, you can't say that, you know, he cheated or you can't say that uh, he's, he's mean. You know, you can't say that he cuts off the money. You can't say that he forces sex. You can't say those things because that's talking bad about your husband. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to protect your man and all the, all the stuff, all the stuff that we say. Okay. Um, this is why people, well, I, I'm laughing. It's not funny, but this is why people can be in a church, uh, situation or, you know, be part of a congregation for many years and not get freedom and not get growth even. Right. So freedom's a choice, but it's not offered from the pulpit in that way. Um, and I, you know, I experienced that. And, and today on, on this side of my untold story, when people who were in my life all these years learn, they get the book, they read the book and they go, man, you were right around and I never knew. Um, you always had a smile on your face and this, that, and the third. Yeah, I was good at image management. We, like it's an acquired skill. <laughs> and not always because I was hiding, because we tell ourselves lies to feel okay with whatever's going on in our lives, right? Like we have to kind of manage the other person's image in our own minds to make it okay. And we tell ourselves those lies. We tell our friends those lies, like this is where we live. And um, sanctuary is an opportunity to come away from that, uh, the prying eyes and be in a safe place where there's no judgment and you just get to be you and you get to be seen. Like you get to be seen, not what you do for somebody, not how you look, you, who you are as a person, everything you are and everything you're not. And just to be fully loved. It's the way I say it is it's love you can sit in and put on and wear and and like like a garment <laughs> and just be permeated in. That's the atmosphere that we have. And so you can find out more about sanctuary, the sanctuary experience at thereboundcoach.com forward slash sanctuary. Um, it's coming up in two very short weekends and we're very excited um, so please reach out if you or someone, you know, needs to be in that safe place. Don't let your untold stories stop you. Don't let stories about what you can and can't afford stop you. Don't let stories about what you can and cannot get done stop you. God is an abundant God. 
he's a God of abundance. And so even as I am learning in my own process through, um, through putting this on, this is the second time we've done sanctuary in this way, the third time in total. Um, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning, you know, God's abundant and all things really are possible. Like all the things really, really are possible. And it's my choice to believe that or not, or to say, hey, my understanding causes limits, <laughs> right? Our understanding can cause us limits or we can put it down and believe everything that God says he is, is true. And we can experience everything he says he is. That's my choice today. I'm inviting you to make the choice with me. You can make it at thereboundcoach.com forward slash sanctuary. Um, do sign up now. You want to fill your, you want us to get your spot and, and get going because uh, especially for those of you who are not local to Florida, you've got some traveling to do. We're, you're going to need your time to get that going. So uh, if you want to help, you want help with creative ways to get it done, contact me. Thereboundcoach.com forward slash sanctuary. Also on social media as The Rebound Coach here on Facebook. On Clubhouse, uh, Dallas Cohen, The Rebound Coach, uh, YouTube, The Rebound Coach, uh, and just about anywhere you can find me. Uh, my phone number is also published, so have no problem taking your call and finding a creative way to get you to sanctuary. So with that, thank you so much for sharing time with me. We will do the after party over on Clubhouse. I would love to know what your untold story is, both the top level where we're talking about wounds we haven't addressed, offenses we haven't addressed, and the bottom level, we're talking about core beliefs and untold stories that keep us stuck. All right. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I will see you next week. And until next time, choose life.